Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Lightweight Java Game Library 3D Game Tutorial and this week we're going to be adding some very simple player movement into the game. Before we start I just want to make clear that this video isn't going to cover anything to do with player animation, that will come in future tutorials and will probably even have its own mini series because it's quite a large and somewhat complicated topic. But for this week we're just going to be creating a player object that we can move around and jump around using the keyboard. So, because we're now going to be working with movement, we need to have some sense of time. We want our movement to be time-based, we want our player to move forward at a certain speed, moving a certain distance per second, not per frame. If we have no sense of time and we just move our player forward a certain distance every frame, when the game gets laggy, your player will move slower, and when the game runs fast, your player is going to move further each second. We don't want our movement to be based on the frame rate because the frame rate can change. We want our movement to be based on actual real life time because in general time progresses at a pretty steady rate no matter how fast or slow your game is running. So let's start off in the display manager class where we're going to create a system to calculate how long each frame is taking to render. So let's create two variables here, one long variable which is going to be the time at the end of the last frame and we're going to have another variable called delta which is a float variable which is going to hold the time taken to render the previous frame. We now need a method down here, a private method, to get the current time and this will return the current time in milliseconds. There's actually a method in lightweight java game library that gets the current time and that's sys.getTime and that will return the current time in ticks which we need to divide by the number of ticks per second which we can get by doing sys.getTime and resolution. Uh, that will give us the time in seconds, so to get it in milliseconds we just multiply that by 1000. So in the update display method we can get the current time, the current frame time in milliseconds by doing get current time. And now we can calculate how long the last frame took to render by doing current frame time minus last frame time. And that will give us the, the time that it took the frame to render in milliseconds. And I like to work in seconds, so we'll convert that to seconds by dividing it by 1000. So now we need a method that allows us to get this delta value, just a simple getter which returns the delta value. And let's also initialize the last frame time variable to get current time when we create the display and that is oh there's one last thing we have to do in the update display after calculating the delta we of course have to set the last frame time to be the current frame time so that it's ready for the next frames calculation so that's all for this class so let's now create a new class in the entities and this is going to be the player class this is going to be an object that represents our player and this is going to of course extend entity because a player is an entity that's going to want you to create a constructor so just let it create the constructor for you and then we're going to add one method in here which is a public method called move and this is going to be the method that we call to move our player around now in the camera class I'm just going to delete all the current movement stuff that we've got because we're going to be using the keyboard uh, inputs for the player now and we're going to be implementing camera movement next week anyway. Let's now create a couple of uh, constants for the player movement. I'm going to create a run speed constant which I'm, which I'm going to set to 20 and a turn speed which is how fast he can turn around which I'm going to get set to 160. And the run speed is in units per second and the turn speed is going to be degrees per second. Let's now create a method to check the keyboard inputs. And first thing we're going to do is to check if the W key is pressed. And if it is we want to move our player forwards. We want him to move forward at a certain speed. So we actually need a, a variable for the current speed which is going to be a float. And we'll... Uh, set that to zero as default so it's not moving forward at all when we start and the current turn speed as well will set to zero 
So if the W key is pressed, we want the current speed to be this to be the run speed. We want our player to move forward at the speed that we set as run speed. And if the S key is pressed, then we want the player to move backwards. So we want the current speed to be negative because we want it to move backwards. And we're going to set that to minus run speed so that the current speed moves the player backwards. And if neither of these keys are pressed, then the current speed should just be zero. The player shouldn't be moving forwards or backwards at all. Now let's check the keyboard for the A and D keys, which are going to turn our player around. So first let's check if the D key is pressed, then we want our player to rotate clockwise. And so we're going to set the current turn speed to uh, minus turn speed which will turn our player clockwise else if the keyboard if the uh, the A key is pressed then we want our player to rotate in the other direction so we're going to set the current turn speed to the turn speed constant and if neither of these keys are pressed then of course we want to set the current turn speed to zero so that the player doesn't turn around when we're not pressing either the D or the A key. So let's call this method in the move uh, method. We can now increase the player's rotation because we know how fast it's the player is now turning. So let's increase the Y rotation of the player by the current turn speed and remember that the current turn speed is the amount it's turning per second so we need to multiply the turn speed by the amount of seconds that have passed and we can get that by doing display manager dot get frame time seconds we also can calculate the distance that the player is going to move forward and we can do that by multiplying the current speed that's the distance per second by the number of seconds and that will tell us how far the player will have moved in the last frame so that's current speed multiplied by display manager dot get frame time seconds so let's imagine for a second that we're looking down on the scene from above here's our player and he's facing in this direction we've already calculated how far he's going to travel this frame and we know the player's rotation around the y-axis but now we just need to find out what the player's next position will be after moving that distance in that direction to do that, we need to find out how far the player needs to move along the x-axis and along the z-axis. Then we can just add the x and z translation to the player's current x and z position and we'll have the player's new position. So basically what we've got here is a right angled triangle where the player's current position is in the bottom left and the player's next position is in the top right. We know that the longest side of the triangle, the hypotenuse, is of length distance d and that the angle in the bottom left corner is the player's y rotation. What we now need to calculate is how far the player needs to move in the x direction and how far the player needs to move in the z direction. And the very basics of trigonometry will tell us that sine theta, where theta is just the y rotation, is equal to x divided by distance d, and that cos theta, or cos of the y rotation, is equal to z over distance d. If that doesn't make sense to you or you've not done trigonometry before then I highly recommend that you read up a bit about it or refresh your knowledge of it because it comes up a lot in game development. I've put some links in the description about basic trigonometry so that you can check that out if you need to. But back to the maths, if we just rearrange these equations by multiplying both sides by d then we have a couple of equations that show us how to calculate the player's x and z movement. So let's now do those calculations to calculate how far the player should move in the x direction and the z direction and as I showed that is for the x direction distance multiplied by the sine of and this has got to be in radians so we convert to radians the player's y rotation and that's going to want you to cast it to a float and then to calculate the distance that the player is going to travel in the z direction it's exactly the same except it's math.cos so now that we've got the distance that the player is going to move in the x and the z direction we can increase the player's position by those two values in the x and the z direction. So let's test out what we've done so far and in the main game loop class I've added, I've created a player using the Stanford Bunny model and I've given it a position and an 
a rotation to start off with. And then in the while loop, I need to call that player.move method to move the player each frame. And then of course we need to send the player to be rendered by doing renderer.process entity. So let's run that and try it out. So I'm going to move the player around using the WASD keys. And as you can see, the player can turn perfectly well. It can move forwards and backwards. And everything is working there as we expected. But the player can't jump. So let's go back into the code and add a jump method. So let's now implement jumping in the code. And we're going to need a couple more constants here. The first one is going to be gravity, which I'm going to set to minus 50. And this should be final as well. And we're also going to have another final float constant, which is the jump power, which will determine how high you jump. As well as that, we're going to need another variable. It's going to be a float, and this is going to be the upward speed of the player. So this will determine how much the Y position of the player is going to increase per second. So that upward speed is going to be decreased every second by the amount that we set gravity to be. So what we have to do is upward speed plus equals because gravity is negative. And then that is, of course, per second. So we have to multiply that by the number of seconds that have passed. Then we're going to increase the Y position of the player using that upward speed, which is, again, per second, so we have to multiply it by the amount of seconds that have passed. So multiply by display manager dot get frame time seconds. And that will pretty much deal with the falling, uh, but that's going to pull you straight through the terrain at the moment. So we need to have uh, some idea of how high the terrain is. And for us at the moment, that's really easy because the terrain is flat and it's hopefully at the Y position of zero. So it's very easy to test at the moment. So for now, all we have to do is we need to get the Y position of the player. We need to test if that Y position is underneath the terrain, because if it's underneath the terrain, we've obviously collided with the terrain and we need to stop falling. So to stop falling, what we're going to do is we're going to set the upward speed, which will probably be negative if you've fallen through the ground. We're going to set that to zero so that you're not moving down or up. And we're obviously going to move the player back onto the terrain because we don't want it to be rendered inside the terrain. So that is falling done, but now we need to do jumping. So let's create a private method called jump. And to jump, all we're going to do is we're going to give the upward speed a little boost. We're going to set the upward speed to the jump power, which will mean the player starts moving upwards every second. Then we're just going to test if the spacebar is pressed in the check inputs method. And if it is, we will call the jump method. So let's put that in here, call the jump method. And now if we go ahead and run that, we've implemented most of jumping. And hopefully if you move around now, the player will jump and then be pulled back down by that gravity because we are uh, decreasing the upward velocity by gravity. But as you can see, if you keep pressing space, you're just going to fly around because we've put no limit on how often you can jump. And obviously that's not very good. So let's go back into the code and we need to know when the player is in the air because we don't want the player to be able to jump when the player is already in the air. So let's have a boolean called is in air and we'll set that to false to start off with. Um, so in the jump method, we don't want to be allowed to jump if we are in the air. So if not in the air, then we can jump. And of course, as soon as we jump, is in air is going to be true. So let's set that to true when we jump. And is in air will go to false if we are found to be underneath the terrain, because that, that means we've landed. And so we should set is in air to false. So if we run that, that should now work. And if we jump up, yeah, if you keep pressing the spacebar, you just uh, just bounce around instead of flying up into the sky like some sort of 
crazy rabbit rocket. So that was just a quick example of how you can implement player movement into a game. It's certainly not the only way and if you know a better way of doing it then by all means use it, but I just wanted to give you some ideas on how you can get started with it if you've never made a 3D game before. Next week we're going to be finally adding some proper camera movement into the game as we program a third person camera. Don't forget to check out yesterday's devlog video about the game that I'm making, a link to that is on the screen now. And you can get in contact with me on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, links to all my social media sites are in the description below. But yeah, thank you guys very much for watching this video, do subscribe if you haven't already, have an awesome week and I will see you all next time.